Welcome back, everyone, to another one-on-one -on -one with Jerry Hall. Today's guest is Mr. George Gammon. If you're tuning in because you saw a tweet by George about this interview, thank you for tuning in. If you're tuning in as you're one of my subscribers, Mr. George Gammon is absolutely an incredible voice as it pertains a perspective of investment in global economics, the macroeconomic view of things. George's got an incredible channel and he took some time to have a conversation with me. This conversation is gonna include his macro outlook, some of his investment strategies, and we're even gonna dive into a little bit of my favorite topic, that's right, digital assets and cryptocurrencies. All that and a lot more. So strap in and as George would say, grab a stiff one and enjoy. So George, thank you so much for taking the time this afternoon to chat with me. How are things in Medellin? Well, as far as the weather, it's gorgeous. But unfortunately, right now, I'm not enjoying the weather very much, being in lockdown mode. We've been under a government lockdown for the last probably three or four weeks. So they let you go to the grocery store once a week based on the last two digits of your ID. But my assistant was telling me this morning that they're uh, a lot, starting Monday, they're allowing people to jog or exercise, bike, roller skate, what have you, from five o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock in the morning. So I'm really excited about that. <laughs> it sounds like something so small, right. you know, but when you've been locked up in an apartment for a month, it's just those little things that you really look forward to. So uh, I've been trying to, normally I'm a guy who goes to the gym every day and I, I've got a, a gal that does all my cooking. And so I, I eat, for most people would be extremely healthy, just a lot of vegetables, organic, all that stuff. Uh, but so it's, it's very difficult to kind of get acclimated to this type of lifestyle. I'm glad it's, it's not permanent. I can imagine. You know, one of the things I found really interesting for those of us that have move south of the border into a Latin American country is the, is the complete switch in paradigms that, at least this is my experience in the Latin American countries I've been in, healthy, organic, locally sourced food is cheaper than the processed, disease-ridden garbage that is cheap in the United States. And it's yeah. because of importing the taxes and things of that nature. Are you finding that true in Medellin also that eating locally sourced, local fresh food is actually cheaper than going and buying stuff that's imported from the United States? Oh, for sure. Yeah. If you buy local stuff, I mean, the cost of living here just in general is a fraction of what it is in the United States. So I always tell people, especially retirees, if they're living on a fixed income like Social Security or some sort of pension, that it, I would consider looking to South America, uh, somewhere where there's an extremely low cost of living so you can not only maintain your standard of life, but hopefully improve on it uh, right. at a much lower cost. But yeah, to your point, food here and, and healthy food that's just grown without a supply chain, just a couple miles away up in the mountains, I'm here in Medellin, is plentiful and it tastes great. That's why the restaurants, one of the reasons why they're so fantastic here. But uh, as far as the, the price, yeah, much, much, much cheaper. Yeah, I found the same thing to be true. In my particular barrio, my butcher raises his own cows and pigs I've got two small local um, papu um, mercados. They're tiny little stores. But the chicken farmer is bringing in chicken three times a week, fresh eggs three times a week. Right. It, and and I've, I'm in, and this is all within like, you know, walking distance of my house, as well as two wonderful little green grocers, the fruit and veg stands yeah. that are being supplied by local farmers. It, it's amazing to me. And it was one of the things that I was looking at as I look at this kind of pandemic that we're in and I'm looking at mortality rates and I'm looking at cases being spread and reported and this, that, and the other thing. And I was thinking, boy, I'm sure glad I'm not in the U S because as a, you know, per capita population, the U S is the most unhealthiest population on the, on the planet. And as I, I believe it's a direct result of the food source. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what it's from, but there is definitely uh, a night and day difference. For the people who are living in the States, I don't think they really notice, they get acclimated to it. As far as how people look and uh, the, the rate of obesity is an example. But once you go outside the States and spend some time in Croatia or, or Montenegro or um, here in Colombia, and then you spend like six, nine months a year outside the States and then fly back into the United States, it, it's, you're in a state of shock that, uh, of, of how unhealthy people actually are. I know that the healthcare system in the United States is far from perfect, but one thing that the, that the experts look at is how much money the United States spends on healthcare and then what the, the average life expectancy is. And they say, look at this, we're spending this much money on healthcare, but the life expectancy isn't that great. But if, I think if they put two and two together, it isn't really a result of the healthcare system being good or bad. It's just the, the, you know, the smoking, the food, just the, the lack of exercise, all those things combined, I think is, uh, is what does it. So one of the things that was like very attractive for me to be persistent in arranging this interview <laughs> was that um, I've really kind of fallen in love with your online content, that you have this incredible YouTube channel, your use of the whiteboard, there's even a bit of fun. It's kind of jovial at times, which makes like learning. <laughs> you can either laugh or cry. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and I'm always fascinated because you have publicly stated that you are not a quote unquote university produced economics academic. So what that, tells me, what that tells me is you've learned that somewhere else. And I'd be really curious, your path to financial literacy possibly includes some mentors and principles you've learned from them and things that you might be able to just by saying them direct other people to investigate. Yeah, so I almost flunked out of high school. <laughs> so as far as from an academic standpoint, I'm pretty much bottom of the barrel. So if, if I can learn this stuff, quite literally anybody can. Uh, I was grew up poor, just uh, was obviously terrible in school. And when I got out of school, the one thing I had going for me is I was an extremely hard worker. And once I got focused on something, I would just dive in head first. And I typically, if I got obsessed about something, I would learn more about it in a month than most people would that were in that industry for a year or two years, just because I'd, I'd try to absorb as much as I could 24 um, seven. I was a self-made millionaire by the time I was 34. And I ended up retiring at the age of 38 in 2012. When I retired, I, I had to figure out what to do with my savings. And I, I was fortunate to, you know, I had some businesses that were failures. I had some that did well. Uh, fortunately, I was, I was able to leave with a little bit more than I, than I lost. Uh, just by a, a fraction, but I, I couldn't uh, afford to maintain my lifestyle without getting, call it a 5% return on my money. So I, I knew that I'm good for a few years, but I, I got to figure this out on my own. And just the way I am, I, I don't like to delegate my, my money or my uh, net worth to just some financial planner. That, that's just not the way I do things. There's no way. So I just dove in head first into macro. What really got it going is I was in Singapore and I remember it like it was yesterday. I was staying at the Marina Bay Sands, which is a hotel casino there. It's one of my favorite hotels and it's about 15 minutes before dinner. And I was just scrolling through YouTube, ironically enough. And I came across a video from Milton Friedman. Uh -huh. uh, it's his free to choose series. And uh, I had always been kind of, I was never political. I didn't know the first thing about macro. I didn't even know what the Fed was. I barely knew how interest rates work. I didn't know what a bond was. I mean, I knew business and I knew how to make money, but as far as investing or economics, or I just had no clue. So when I stumbled across his free to choose series, it really resonated with me. And I just, these were all these 
thoughts that I had in my mind, but I never heard anyone articulate them that well. So I just, that really got me excited. And then I went down the rabbit hole uh, from Friedman. I started uh, studying Thomas Sowell. And from those guys that branched off to uh, Jim Rogers, Mark Faber, uh, Jim Grant, Peter Schiff, of course. And I just started getting obsessed with macro, just like I had been obsessed with business prior to retiring. And um, I remember coming, uh, doing a lot of work with, uh, or watching a lot of videos and audiobooks from Jim Rogers. And I really liked his investment style. You just try to buy things when they're super cheap, when everybody hates them, just hold them for a long time. And as long as you're making good fundamental decisions, that just always made a lot of sense to me. So when I, this was now the middle of 2012, and um, still trying to figure out how to invest. And I came across a chart of the Japanese housing market back in 1990. And I saw that when it had collapsed, it had from peak to trough went down by about 60%. And if you recall, the US housing market in 2012 was bottoming out. Now at that time, of course, no one knew that was the bottom. Right. In fact, uh, most people thought that it was just going to go down forever. And if you would have invested in real estate in 2012 in the U.S., people would tell you you're absolutely out of your mind. You're crazy. So, uh, But I just kind of compared the charts, and I saw that in the United States, adjusted for inflation, it had come down by roughly 50%, but it came down to its historic trend line going back to the year 1900. This is in the United States. So uh, just thinking through it like Jim Rogers, if you will, I said, maybe U.S. real estate is, is a good place to be. And I was dating a gal in Kansas City at the time. Uh, she, she was a, a model in New York and her family lived in Kansas City. So I'd kind of fly there and have her fly down to KC. Great family. But anyway, we were out uh, drinking one night. And this was after I'd, a couple of weeks after I'd stumbled across this chart and you know, kind of put two and two together. And they said, you know, George, you can buy these houses here at a tax foreclosure auction and you can get them for like five, six thousand bucks. And they were in the construction business. And I thought, OK, well, there's got to be a catch there. It's how you can buy a house for five thousand dollars you know, in a free market. Why isn't everyone just lining up, bidding up the price anyway? Figured that out. I figured out why they were selling for five thousand dollars, and uh, but I'm like, listen, guys, and I remembered the real estate stuff I saw in my charts and thinking through it like Jim Rogers. So I told this gal's family, I said, listen, I'll come in with the money, I'll buy all the houses, I'll uh, provide the the money for the remodel. You guys do all the work. We'll sell them, flip them, we'll split profits. And uh, so the first day we went to the tax auction, I bought six houses. And uh, the, the rest is, is history. So since that point, I, that's where I really got involved with real estate, but it was a result of really getting obsessed with macro, which goes back to the Marina Bay Sands and Milton Friedman. And, but since that point, I've all, my, my first passion has been macro. And even when I was doing the real estate, every single day I, all i would do whether i was looking at houses or you know driving to a, another job site or something like that or flying going around the world doesn't matter i would have my earbuds in i'd be listening to podcasts audiobooks youtube videos just i mean every waking hour whether it was at breakfast i'm in the shower i mean to this day if i'm in the shower i, I don't shower unless i've got my ipod or my phone right there playing the latest uh, Peter Schiff podcast or um, you know, the latest uh, podcast from Macro Voices, a real vision or something like that. So that was kind of the journey, but I guess the short answer is that I, I was completely self-taught, never taken an econ class, never taken a finance class. Like I said, almost flunked out of high school, but uh, it was just an obsession for the last uh, eight years or so, and it still is. And that's how I, I know so much about this uh, very esoteric, bizarre topic that is macro. I, I appreciate that. My guess is, and you didn't talk about this, but observationally, I would go out on a limb and say, in addition to the consumption of the data and the information and the points of view and the perspectives, as well as the context behind what you're consuming, 
part of your process is that you also learn through teaching, through explaining to others, you reinforce or, or maybe better articulate certain different points. At least that's my guess. Would you consider yourself somebody who teaches while you're learning? That's a good question. It doing the videos definitely prompts me to do more thorough research. If I wasn't doing the videos, I, I wouldn't really dive in that deep. I just kind of I'd understand how it works. I'd be okay. That's cool. I totally get it. But when you're doing a whiteboard video and, and you and your objective is to explain this as as well as you possibly can, you got to do a lot more research and and really get down to the nitty gritty. And that's uh, one reason why I really like doing the interviews with, uh, you know, all these economic superstars that I'm very fortunate to have the opportunity to talk to and kind of pick their brains. And I do that a lot of times if I'm really stumped on something, I'll call or I'll email like Jeff Snyder as an example, and I'll try to set up an interview because I know that I'll be able to ask him this question and really get to the bottom of how this works. And it's really neat that, that most of the guys and gals I talk to are, they're just so generous with their time. And they're, they're such nice people that even after the conversation, I'll be like, you know, how does that work in the bank banking system? I remember one time, Steve Keen, uh, I, I just could not figure out if, if paying back, well, I know paying back a loan decreases the money supply technically, but I didn't know if you default on the debt, if that could also decrease the money supply. And so he texted me right back over Twitter and he kind of walked me through it. And then when he did, I'm like, okay, yeah, if that happens, it's going to decrease the money supply. If this happens, it's not, it's, it has to do with velocity. It has to do with bank equity. It has to do with all these things. And it's just uh, really, really cool. My point is that if it weren't for the videos, I wouldn't be getting uh, that granular, but it's just, it's a neat learning experience for me because I think my macro understanding has improved exponentially since I started doing the videos, call it eight months ago. Sure. And I will tell you one of the wonderful things, and it stuck for me, it started when I started to move out of my equity positions. This was January of 2018. Okay. I had retired back in 2015, went and spent a year and a half in Hawaii working on organic farms, just having a blast. And when it was time to come take care of my mom before she passed, I started kind of dabbling back in the markets and I built up a little portfolio and it was basically, you know, your stuff that you could get on your Schwab account, you know, some oil. Right. I got into cannabis, made a little money, you know, just looking at value. Then I came to Costa Rica to get my eye surgery done. I got LASIK done down here and I met a waiter and he talked to me about cryptocurrencies. And I thought it was interesting. And I started thinking about how, see, he framed it in a way of here are these incredible disruptive technologies. Well, I lived through the dot-com boom. I lived through the cellular adoption prior to the dot-com boom. So I've seen evolution take root in markets and change fundamentally the way people live, right? As a whole. I mean, it's kind of a general statement. And I thought, okay, this needs investigation. So I came home, February 2018, started investigating, got a little skin in the game March, and by June, and this is every day, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours a day, just yeah, you know, reading PDF, <laughs> reading white papers, um, yeah. trying to understand this, that, and the other thing. I'm fully invested by June. Now I'm fully, fully invested in this cryptocurrency scene. And I'm starting to see that my knowledge around global markets is lacking. So I'm looking for content and I find real vision. And Fantastic. I'll never forget, I'll never forget watching this particular, these two particular hour plus long videos that Raul did, one on a coming recession and one on the retirement crisis. And it wasn't necessarily the content in the video that was the big monumental aha. It was that I was being shown the underlying data and that, so I reversed engineered Case Schiller 25. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I had no idea what that was. 
So I go and I find out and I learn about it. I learn about how to, how to look at these, you know, um, goods and services being shipped across on ships, looking yes, at I railway agree. traffic, looking at new car sales, looking at car volume production, looking at, you know, real estate, looking at, you know, you just, it really forced me to learn about global markets, not just what's going on in the U.S., which also takes you to, now you got to learn about debt markets. Now you got to learn about this wonderful world of bonds, whether it be a T-bill, a note, or a, you know, a corporate bond and what the different grades mean in this, you know what I mean? It was like, sure. The, the, the rabbit hole I went down has allowed me to stay sane and busy and actually happy, even though the market where my investment is, is still depressed. It's, it hasn't taken off like I had hoped. You know what I mean? I do. I do. I mean, for, for some people, just having a better understanding of the world around you, uh, I think it empowers people to, or hopefully it empowers people to make better decisions moving forward on not only their, with their financial future, but with the future of their family and, and their personal freedom. Absolutely. So one of the things I started, I started to get myself occupied is I'm, you know, I have a little company down here. It's called Digital Asset Association in English, Association de Activos Digitalis in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And it's all about educating in the Spanish language, the history of money. Okay. How currency is created. It goes into detail about fractional reserve banking. It goes into understanding how those derivative products in the gold market, you know, when you're talking about gold leases, what does that mean? You know what I mean? Because a lot of people don't understand how this system works. And I don't know if it's intentional or not, but I can tell you going to some, you know, very good schools in the United States, whether it be elementary school, junior high, high school, junior college and universities, I never got anything really about financial literacy. And I don't know if that's intentional to keep the population dumb, but it's, it's the fact. And so I'm making it my mission to create easily digestible information and content for the Spanish language population, because I believe if everybody has the understanding how the game is played, then if they choose to play it, the barrier to entry isn't that large. Right, especially with the internet, I think it's a great point. And if there's any group of people that should be skeptical about fiat currency, it should be those individuals in South America, if history tells us anything, right? I mean, they've hyperinflated their currency, they meaning the countries, uh, just so many times. I, I think that's why, I'm sure it's probably the same in Costa Rica, why real estate, uh, as an example, is kind of their default savings account where right. in the United States we see it as a 401k or maybe even you know just a CD or a money market fund you have it's just kind of just a, a way to earn a bit of a interest rate on your currency units where here you, you know, people don't invest in CDs or money markets or bonds or anything like that because it's directly correlated with their purchasing power that they have or don't have with their fiat currency as a result of inflation. So they just shove everything into real estate because typically, especially in a market that doesn't have a lot of leverage, meaning that there's not, uh, that most of the, the housing units in a market, they, they don't have a lot of debt associated with them. Like 3% of Colombians have, have a mortgage, as an example, compared to maybe 40 or 50% of Americans. So if you, you have, if you have a housing market that doesn't have much debt in the system, therefore people don't have mortgage payments, therefore people don't have to sell their home under financial duress, right. then in those types of markets, you see them often using their real estate as a savings account, like I was saying earlier. Sure. No, it's I, and, and I'm glad that they've done that. However, it, it is, it is limited. And in Latin American countries, when their currency really is dependent on the U.S., so the stronger the U.S. dollar, the weaker their currency, you know, it's, it's not advantageous. And if they don't have access to markets 
where they can get vehicles, you know, safe vehicles, good vehicles, solid vehicles to participate in other markets, then they're stuck with what they're stuck with. It's like they don't have any choice. Yeah, yeah. And a you lot of that has to do with their, their visa and passport and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, as far as, as cryptocurrency, there's, I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's a very elegant solution for so many of the world's problems. It uh, is coming from a decentralization of money. It's, it's so superior. I mean, I just, being in Colombia as an example, and, and you know this being in Costa Rica, you want to wire down a hundred grand from the States or something like that. I mean, geez, you just got to go through this and that. And even I'm very fortunate in the sense that the fiduciary I work with here in Colombia, they know me extremely well because I've been doing real estate here since 2015. So I, I know them on a first name basis. And um, but if in for me, it's still that you got to go through the wire. It's got to go to the intermediary bank in New York. Then it has to come down into Colombia. Then you've got to tell them when to exchange it into pesos and then you've got to write a little you have to have your lawyer submit a kind of like a form to their central bank that tells right. the central bank what you're using the funds for and blah, blah 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 and then compare that to the other day i did an interview with uh with an, an aussie gentleman that's um that's very knowledgeable in cryptocurrency and uh i had never really traded or exchanged Bitcoin back and forth. So he says, George, just do me a quick favor here. Just while we're talking, we're, we're still doing the interview. He says, sure. just download this app. It was, uh, I think the, the wallet of Satoshi was the app. Uh -huh. And so I'm like, okay, blah, 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 I'll do that. And he says, now take your phone. And he goes, you got a little code on there. I said, yeah, I see it. He goes, put your phone right up to the, Dream. Yeah, the camera. webcam yeah. right there. And so I did that. He says, okay, now turn your phone around. I look at it and I had like, you know, a dollar in Satoshi bucks what? or something. I'm like, damn, I'm like, that is cool. <laughs> that is cool right there. You just did that over a webcam in a matter of five seconds compared to what I have to go through all this rigmarole with the, the you know, the Swift system and, and all that. And uh, it's just so superior. From a philosophical standpoint, I couldn't be more of an advocate of, right. uh, of cryptocurrency for sure. I could not agree more. That's that's why I said I'm all in. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. I'm all in. I could have, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm, <clears throat> pardon me. When when I decided to get into into this space, this digital asset space, I had a had a couple of ways I could go. I could try to eke out three, four percent passive income, you know, and and write it out, you know. Get a, get a bump in my monthly income when I am eligible for social security. Or, or I could live like a pauper, put my egg in, into the projects that I did all the research on and believe are the game changers and write it out. And although the market hasn't agreed with my thesis, I will tell you the research and the progress and the infrastructure has, and I know it's it's not a matter of if anymore. We're way past the if; it's a matter of when. You, you know yeah, what I mean? I and, do. Um, yeah. So, like, I live a little differently than you. I live on three hundred and fifty U.S. dollars a month. That's my fully furnished studio apartment, all utilities and food included in that. But as you can see, I'm on the internet talking to you. Um, I've had the good fortune of building my little program up here. I think I got 40, 40 something interviews in the, you'll be like 41. Yeah. Uh, I mean, look at how nice your background is. I mean, you make me look like a schmuck here. I, got, I look oh, like I'm in prison and you got this cool one-on-one -on -one with Jerry and the microphone. Yeah. It looks fantastic. Well, you know, this <laughs> is Zoom and what this is on Zoom, this is a virtual background. Oh, so yeah. No, I need no one of those things. Being needed. Well, you're on Zoom now. You don't need a green screen. You just need to find a good, you know, have a graphic person make it for you, make it yourself, or find a great photo. Yeah. That you really want behind you. You know what I mean? But it, it's that two minutes, bam, done. We're on the internet. We're talking. The um, I'll tell you when one of when I really dove into George Gammon, I went back through your catalog, your library. 
Okay. <laughs> and I found your multi episode or multi installment piece on the renovation of the artist's apartment. Oh yeah. 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 And, and I really liked it. I'm curious because I haven't got to the end of that. Did you yeah. end up keeping that exquisite tiny parquet floor in that yeah. one bedroom? In both, both all bedrooms. Oh, the, the parquet was in every bedroom? Yeah. Oh, okay. You only really illustrated the one bedroom having that floor, but it was throughout. It's still there? Oh, yeah. Do you still own that apartment? I do. We, we It would have been on the market uh, by now, and it most likely would have sold, but obviously not uh, with, with what's going on with the virus. So we still have that project. We still have the platinum project. We still have the gold apartment. Uh, yeah, we, we've got all those. But now the gold apartment was a, a, a rental, so it's a little bit different. But the sure. art apartment, we'll go ahead and sell that when we're able to, when we're able to put it back on the market. And then we'll finish up the platinum apartment as well. Wow. I think that is incredible. I'm really glad that you, uh, I'm really glad that you did that. Was that, for instance, the, the artist apartment sets a video. Was that your first kind of foray that time, that time period, was that your first foray into creating YouTube content? Yeah. The, the YouTube channel story is, is kind of unique from the standpoint of uh, I did a TV show before we did the YouTube channel. So in, in Columbia. Correct. Yeah. It, I went, I just had this crazy idea that I saw all these projects that I was doing with my team. I've got a husband and wife team that have worked for me since 2014. Uh, the architect, his name is Joaquin. His wife is Angie. She's my designer. They're just absolute rock stars at yeah. what they do and they're the ones who really manage that whole real estate business for me I, I nowadays i don't really get involved too much other than just buying the deals and then determining what price point and all that stuff and obviously it's my money uh but they're they really manage most of that so and they're just a young couple they're fantastic they're charismatic they're they're they just got all the pieces of the puzzle so I thought, and this was early 2019 or late 2018, and I was here and I thought, you know what, why don't we do one of these house flipping shows? We're doing it every day anyway. If they're that popular in the United States, I'm sure they'd be popular here in Medellin as well. So I went to the local TV station, Telemedellin, and mm -hmm. I pitched them on it and they said, yeah, okay, it's kind of interesting. And we came up with a deal that I'd produce it. I'd be the executive producer. I'd, I'd create every episode. Then I just basically hand them the thumb drive and they'd put it on air. And um, th that it worked great. It was, it was hugely popular. Everyone loved it. Um, it was interesting because I, I don't speak fluent Spanish. I understand a bit. I don't speak uh, it that well. But I had to be in the in the show in every episode so it was the it revolved around kind of the three of us i was the real estate investor they're the architect and the designer and we go to all my projects and as they progress i mean it's just like flip or flop or any of those shows that you see in the states so anyway we did that after the first season uh, we were gonna do a second season just have a bit of a delay and i thought okay let's go ahead and start a youtube channel because i've got all these awesome editors and camera people and it just makes sense to continue moving forward with this brand. The show is called Vita and Remodelacion. And so we did that. And then I said, well, I might as well do a George Gammon YouTube channel as well. And it, let's do real estate investing. I, it seems to be a pretty popular topic nowadays. So, uh, you know, be, be a, a good use of my human resources that I had at my disposal. And so the first, the first few videos, it, I didn't use any of the editors. It was literally me just trying to figure out how YouTube worked. So that's why it's just me kind of talking and I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm kind of just, okay, click, 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 click. And then after about a month or a month and a half of that, then uh, we were done with the show. So then I could take my editors and say, okay, how do we do this? So none of us knew how to do a, a YouTube channel, but we did know how to do a TV show. So that's why the first few uh, videos that you see were kind of like vlogs and we were editing them very similar to the way that we edited the TV show. And uh, oddly enough, they weren't that popular. And then my whole thing is, as you can probably tell, is macro. I mean, I love real estate investing, but 
I'm really passionate about uh, the quantitative easing, the Fed, the repo market, all that stuff. So I thought to myself, well, let me do a couple of these videos because I actually like talking about macro more than I like talking about real estate investing. So I tried a couple and of course those were the ones that really took off and uh, were extremely popular. And uh, also too, we, and I think it might be a good lesson for those of the viewers who are more uh, entrepreneurial or trying to you know, decide or figure out how to start their own business, whether it's online or not. And that the first, now the most popular videos I do are these whiteboard videos, which I'm, I guess you've seen. Uh, but before, that. When we first started doing it, you know, there was no whiteboard. And what happened is I was just horrible at presenting and articulating my thoughts to the camera. And so we thought, okay, I, I, I suck at this. I mean, I'm terrible at trying to explain, let's say, how the, the Fed creates money out of thin air if I'm just talking right into a camera. And so I thought, okay, I'm terrible at this. How can I make it better? I'm like, I've got to get some sort of crutch. I know what I'll do. Let's go to Office Depot. Let's grab a whiteboard and I'll write everything up on a whiteboard and maybe I can just explain it what I've already written on the board and maybe that'll make it easier because I'm so bad at presenting my thoughts any other way. And there you go. So the moral of the story is if you're an entrepreneur out there, as long as you got the ambition, as long as you got the hustle, just keep iterating, keep throwing stuff up against a wall. Sooner or later, something's going to stick. And when you do find out what your customers like or your audience likes, just do more of that and you're going to be successful. I couldn't agree more. You know, and I'll tell you from, from where I'm sitting, if anybody asked my advice in a form like this, hey, Jer, I've come into capital to deploy real estate, gold, crypto, bonds, what, what do you think? I'd say none of the above. Until you have an understanding of the global macro, then you don't you, it doesn't matter which asset you pick. If you can't look down the road and forecast, is it trending up? Is it trending down? There are macro indicators that are easily available to you know find these things. Then you shouldn't just pick an asset class and go. Right, you're gonna get you know too emotional. I mean? You're gonna yeah, get too well, emotional. It's emotional and it's uninformed. It's. The thing yeah. that macro has brought to me is, is an information where if I take it in, then when I expel my expression, the trade or the setup or the thing I want to invest in, it's coming from a place of looking at the, how it fits into the whole picture. Right. And that to me is the, the, the real secret sauce of global macro isn't any one particular thing, it's being able to understand an array of these things and how do they fit together and being able to assign probabilities and even possible time horizons. Right. And you do a great job of illustrating that. I just want my, my hats off. I, I'm a huge fan. I don't know if you could tell so far, but yeah. I can see your content. I really like it. You know, so yeah. I appreciate that. And I think you hit the nail on the head. If you can understand what's going on better, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help you make a lot better decisions, short term or in the long term. And it's going to help you understand what skill set you already have that you can leverage to a greater degree to increase your, your wealth. A good example of that is back in 2015 or 2014, that's when oil crashed the last time. It went down under $30 a barrel and the Colombian peso is uh, correlated to a certain degree to the price of oil. So I, I knew that I wanted to go long oil, and I, but I didn't know anything about oil, but I, I knew that from understanding macro. So I thought, well, if I can buy some sort of asset that's denominated in pesos, I'm kind of going long oil and I, I'm more comfortable with that. Cause at the time I was down in Ecuador oh. and I, I thought, okay, well, let me go over to Medellin or let me go to Columbia, see if I can buy some real estate there. So, because I knew that real estate is a game I understand. Sure. So, but I wanted to go long oil, don't know anything about oil. 
but I knew that that was correlated to the currency. And I knew that if I bought real estate denominated in that currency, I'm basically going long oil with something I actually know about. And I thought, okay, there could be kind of a double whammy here where if I can buy an asset, get Angie and Joaquin to improve it. So I get some equity build through the remodel and I can get a pop on the currency because oil goes back up. Well, then I'm, I'm making double money. And if by chance the currency doesn't go up or oil doesn't go back up, at least I've, I'm kind of hedging my bets with, uh, with the additional value I'm creating through the remodel. You know, taking an asset, you got, let's say your cost base is 100 grand, goes up to 200 grand, great. Now you got $100,000 of cushion. And if you're, you're, if you're making a good bet on oil, well, now you're going to make 125 or 150 grand as opposed to just the 100. So that's kind of the way I, I saw it. And I think that... Um, that trade or that bet, that investment, however you want to look at it, I think it's an, a, a way to your point that you can leverage macro to um, increase your ROI and just make better decisions. George, that was like a really articulate way to express exactly the process I was talking about, where you knew you you knew oil was the play, but you weren't sure the process. So what you did is you worked back through a macro framework yeah. to, to really establish that your comfortable play, right? The way you wanted to express your trade idea was through real estate Be mm -hmm. and, and you substantiated because this, 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 and this, that process in and by itself is priceless. If people can start to understand global macroeconomics, then they can start to extrapolate and express themselves through their trades in a way that makes them feel most comfortable. Yeah, and, and in a way where they are in an environment or in an industry that they know well themselves, whatever you do, whether you're a doctor, maybe you know pharmaceuticals, and then you can study macro and figure out a way to play that particular market. For me, of course, it was real estate, but uh, regardless of, of what you do, most people in the developed world have has a they have a skill set or a knowledge base in a particular industry. And uh, just going back to Jim Rogers, it's exactly what he always says: just try to invest in things that you know well. Exactly. I learned that that way of looking at it, the way to frame. I have, like you said, oil. So it started with oil and working back that process, including the global macro framework. I got that from Raul Powell. Yeah, now, he, he, forever grateful. Incredible. Yeah, incredible, incredible man. I uh, got a chance to spend an hour on Zoom with him and record it. Grant Williams. I have a bunch of guys from the Real Vision team are in my library. And it's just been a joy because even though they give me an hour, I can go back and watch and get something new, you know, if yeah. I go back and watch it. And that's the wonderful thing about this whole YouTube or video internet space is that the time we spend today literally can be here forever to benefit whoever finds it or, or is looking for it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Now, are most of your viewers in the crypto space or interested? It's, it's becoming more and more <clears throat> interest in global economics. Okay. And, and it might be a direct result of more of the global economics truth seekers are finding me because the names on the interviews are names like Raul Powell, Grant Williams, Mark Yusko, George Gammon, et cetera. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah, but yeah. yeah. It's been a lot of crypto also. Well, one thing I'd like to explain to them that, that might tie in to what we're saying is, is and for those people who are interested in Ripple or, or Bitcoin, they're saying, yeah, okay, I get it. I understand how George did this with real estate, but it really doesn't apply to me because what I know is crypto and I, I don't really get it. I don't see the connection there. Well, I did a video maybe a month ago where I outlined Jeff Snyder's take on the gold market in mm. 2008. Right. And what you can see if you look at, oddly enough, the repo market, you can see something that what they call repo fails. 
And <laughs> I, I don't want to go, I won't go into great detail, but when you have a, a repo transaction in the dollar funding market, let's say between Goldman Sachs or their primary, deal, a right. primary dealer, and like a hedge fund, that's basically the hedge fund saying, okay, I need some cash just to get me through the, the next couple of days because all my assets are illiquid and I, I've got to pay, uh, who knows, I got to make a payment to uh, uh, JP Morgan or something like that. So they need some liquidity or cash. So they'll go into the repo market, they'll offer collateral. It's called a treasury. And uh, Goldman Sachs will see that. So, okay, we'll take your treasury. We'll give you the cash you need. Then uh, tomorrow we can just swap back or some. It, it's called a, a, a repurchase uh, agreement or a repo transaction. So anyway, you, you've got these, these repo transactions. Well, when the market gets under a lot of stress, you see a lot of repo fails. And that's a variety of different reasons. That's a whole other rabbit hole. But a lot of times the person who is agreeing to give the cash at the last minute, they'll say, uh, no, I've decided I don't want to do this. Whether there's too much counterparty risk or they don't like the collateral that's being offered, maybe it's, maybe it's been hypothecated or something, which means it's been borrowed from another party and that hedge fund is representing it as though it's their own and it's not, it's something they're <laughs> borrowing from their buddy. So, uh, so you see these repo fails. So if, there's, uh, if that hedge fund, as an example, needs the cash, and that that uh, agreement fails at the last moment, they're going to have to sell whatever liquid asset they have to come up with the liquidity or to come up with the cash. So what you see going back to 2008 is when the repo fails really spiked, the gold price came down dramatically. And uh, there was a correlation there. And it made a lot of sense because these big financial institutions would have to sell anything they had to come up with this liquidity if they couldn't get that repo transaction or that liquidity. And then sure enough, when the Fed came in and through talking up the market or a variety of different things, they made it seem as though the market was less risky then you would see the gold price go back up because the fundamentals would take over from the standpoint of the Fed's most likely going to print money and uh, you know you got a greater money supply so we're going to go ahead and buy gold or the, the, the whole market is a little uneasy so let's go into a safer asset. So my point and the point I made with the video is that if you go back to when we were really having these market crashes a couple uh, weeks ago or a month ago or so, you would see, you saw gold sell off the exact same way, but you also saw, saw Bitcoin mm -hmm. sell off. So my point, and I, I'm not saying there's a direct correlation, but there could be. And if I'm someone that's really all about Bitcoin and I see the price of Bitcoin go down at a time when I think it should be going to the moon, maybe understanding macro and understanding what Jeff Snyder is talking about is going to help me maintain that position and win in the long run when otherwise I might not know what the hell is going on and I might liquidate because I'm saying to myself, well, I thought this crypto stuff is supposed to be a safe haven asset. And obviously it's not a safe haven if it's going down when the whole entire world is collapsing. So that's just another example of how understanding macro can potentially benefit you. Oh, I could, I could not agree more. And, it, and it's that whole, you know, for a lot of folks that have come into the crypto space, probably over the last three years, but more specifically the last two years, they probably came into the space hoping to see a repeat of like a December 2017, you know, astronomical parabolic moves in the market. Right. Yeah. I can tell you that there was a large element of that that had me get in. Right. However, however, what it's done for me and many, many, many others is it's opened the door, right, to jump into this rabbit hole and really, really start to understand how things work. Like, for instance, case in point, if you're only looking at the market price of the asset that you put an investment in, how do you really know what's going on? For me, my investment, I primarily in XRP, which is from Ripple, basically. Okay. And I understand its value proposition, right? It presents several second settlement. 
So for instance, in the case in point, you were talking about the repo market. If Goldman Sachs had a 300 billion yen position that wasn't going to settle for two days, but they needed that money as an asset on their balance sheet, they would have to go to the repo market, get that money, either put up some other asset they had as collateral, or if they would, if the person took the yen position that was coming, take that. The thing that XRP does, because it, it's, it conveys the value so quickly, if the liquidity is in the Japanese, you know, this to that, three seconds, now, now the system is not dependent on that overnight borrowing window because transactions are actually settling in real time, not two or three right. days later, not as some byproduct of the Bank of International Settlements and then maybe two or three other clearinghouses along the way. So yeah. the efficiency of our markets with this new technology, removing that friction actually adds value to the system, not just in the cost of doing transactions, but in the knock on effects of how will that impact the repo market? How will that impact any kind of overnight borrowing to cover shortfalls because of Basel's risk, you know, um, um, regulations around your balance sheet, you know, balancing at the start of business. Yeah. Y you know what I mean? I'm sure I butchered I some of the terminology because I'm, I'm no George Gammon, but I have an understanding of the friggin' system and I, the light bulb is on. This new technology is so beneficial. And for case in point for Ripple and what Ripple's doing with RippleNet, Ripple, is, Ripple and RippleNet are not open to George and Jerry. You know that, right? As far as open Bitcoin source code. is open to everybody. Uh, what do you mean by open? Are you talking about open source as far as the code or just Correct. available as far as the service? XRP Ledger is open source. XRP, the token, can go back and forth. Right. However, RippleNet, which is dealing with the banks, the financial institutions, works 100% behind the bank firewall, no access to the public. Okay, it's right, a right. complete ecosystem unto itself, extremely secure, all regulatory compliance is in play, and all their partners in that ecosystem meet those standards. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I do. It's now... There'll be a lot of people that'll tell you Bitcoin is the one and Bitcoin is valuable and I enjoy Bitcoin and I think it was revolutionary, but I've done George two years of every single day research and every single day, my confirmation or my conviction level in my trade goes up despite the market value. And it's because of the infrastructure that's being built and the markets that are going to be directly affected as a direct result of that inv innovation. It's just value, right? So capital always flows to value in the end. Correct, Mundo? Right, well. For the most part? For, for the most part, yeah, unless you got the Fed manipulating the entire uh, economy, but yeah, theoretically, yes. Right, you're right. <laughs> okay, Harry's correct theoretically. So that's why, I, that's why my chips are on that particular bet because of all the things that I just mentioned, not to mention the, the knock on or downstream stuff with all the other developers that are developing on the open source software, utilizing this extremely fast, secure, low cost digital asset to convey value from one thing to another. Right. Yeah, I mean, it makes total sense. The way I do that with my personal portfolio is I, I segment it into insurance investments and speculations. And speculations are defined by something that I think is just gonna go up in price, or an investment is defined by something that, I, that has to pay me to own it. Right. So a rental property would, in my opinion, would be a, an investment. Something like Bitcoin or, uh, or XRP would be a speculation. And uh, I just do, yeah, I kind of do that. Uh, just it, it meets my investment goals. Uh, sure. Hopefully it meets my investment goals. It's just a way to add some asymmetry to the portfolio while at the same time hedging some downside risk. But uh, as far as the speculative side of the portfolio, I don't know that there's anything that has more asymmetry than cryptocurrency. You've got, obviously your, your downside is defined, but uh, right. you're, 
upside is, my goodness, almost uh, unlimited. I'm not sure where XRP is trading. Bitcoin, I'm assuming it's it's around 6,000 today. Maybe, maybe 71, 71, 72, maybe 71. 76 right. as we speak. Yeah, I mean, you say yeah. even if your downside on Bitcoin is zero, which I don't really think it is. Well, it's, it's under 1,000 is your downside. So you can lose six grand or it can go up to a million. It, it, it all, so it's from a, a, a standpoint of asymmetry, which you really need on the speculative side of your portfolio to have a mathematical edge to where if you keep placing those bets over long term, you're going to win. Uh, I didn't go into my background in blackjack, but that's a whole other, that's a whole other uh, podcast episode. <laughs> Former professional Texas Hold'em player, three years, supported myself and my son solely. Yeah, so, so you totally understand the probabilities and, and the, oh, yeah. you, have to, you have to build a portfolio to make sure that you have a, a mathematical edge. One thing that I've talked about in some of my videos, it, it isn't that popular, but I talk about the Kelly Criterion. I talk about, I talk about binomial calculators. And if, if, in my opinion, if you're really getting uh, good, you could go through your portfolio with a binomial calculator. And although obviously you can't judge probabilities perfectly, you can take some guesstimations and say, okay, if I, let's say you've got 10 bets in your portfolio, you can say, okay, if I put these bets on a hundred times, am I going to have a, a greater or lesser chance of coming out ahead? And if uh, you go through that binomial calculator, and you have a, a, a lesser chance, then you know you need to do some adjusting in that portfolio pretty fast. Exactly. Wow, what a great interview. I am so, again, so glad that you accepted the invitation. <laughs> I hope that we can continue to collaborate in the future. I don't know what that would look like, but I hope I've imparted upon you at least enough of a sense of who I am that if I reach out to you again, you'll answer. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Right on. Well, well, it, 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 sometimes you got to give it a little time if you direct message me on Twitter or something like that. Because well, I have I, your email now. I, so I'll just I'm sorry. You an I have your email, so when you get it, you'll reply when you can. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'll always. Sometimes it takes me a couple days. It just uh, because no what people have to understand is I just I don't I do a lot more than just the the YouTube channel. That's something I do for fun. But uh, well, not right now, because obviously with the virus, we're all under lockdown and everything. But generally, without the virus, uh, right. I've got a lot going on with the real estate side. Although I've got Angie and Joaquin, I still have to go manage this and manage that. So sure. I, I can be uh, pretty busy. But uh, yeah, I, I always enjoy talking about these subjects. And uh, I love talking to people who understand macro and and know something that i don't and that's why i like talking or hopefully i'll be able to talk to more and more people in the crypto space because out of all things macro that's definitely what um where i'm deficient for sure well you know what we all get better when we work with each other no man is an <laughs> island right that's right no man's an island so george thank you for your time for those of you that have tuned in Gracias. And until next time.